Good afternoon. Welcome to the CDP webinar, Complex Humanitarian Emergencies, Philanthropy's Role in Recovery. This is Regine Webster, Vice President of the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. This webinar is provided with generous funding from the UPS Foundation and is co-sponsored by the Council on Foundations, the Funders Network for Smart Growth and Livable Communities, Emerging Practitioners in Philanthropy, New England International Donors, and Interaction. I'd like to highlight a few reminders before we get started. First, this webinar is being recorded. Um, so it'll be available on our website and also on our YouTube channel shortly after the webinar is complete. Second, you can submit questions at any time using the Q&A box and they'll be answered at the end of the panel presentation. And lastly, if you're on Twitter, please use hashtag CDP for recovery to share the discussion. This webinar is first in our series on raising awareness of and responding to global disasters. Our discussion will cover what complex humanitarian emergencies, or CHEs, are and how they're different from other disasters, what recovery looks like in a complex humanitarian emergency, a closer look at two complex humanitarian emergencies that will be supported by CDP's Global Recovery Fund, Yemen and Venezuela, and then lastly, how philanthropy can be more involved in CHEs and why philanthropic response matters. The United Nations, the UN, defines a CHE as a humanitarian crisis in a country, region, or society where there's total or considerable breakdown of, of authority resulting from internal or external conflict and which requires an international response that goes beyond the mandate or capacity of any single and or ongoing UN country program. In thinking about the causes of complex humanitarian emergencies, as you can see here on the screen, they involve an acute emergency layered over ongoing instability. And there are multiple scenarios that can cause complex humanitarian emergencies, like the civil wars in Syria and Yemen, or the man-made political crisis in Venezuela. These emergencies may be worsened by famine and heightened by the outbreak of disease or a health emergency. If you'd like to learn more about complex humanitarian emergencies, we'd encourage you to read our Complex Humanitarian Emergencies Issue Insight. It can be found on our website, disasterphilanthropy.org, under the Disasters header. And now it gives me such great joy to introduce our guest. Um, these are individuals, humanitarian practitioners that have been in this space for multiple decades and who I've had the good fortune of knowing um, some as long as 19 to 20 years ago, all the way to the past two or three years. Um, so I'm just thrilled that we're getting to bring their expertise and experience to bear. Joel Sharney is the Executive Director of the Norwegian Refugee Council USA, or NRC which focuses on humanitarian advocacy and fundraising in the United States on behalf of Oslo-based NRC. Prior to joining NRC USA in March 2016, Joel was the Vice President for Humanitarian Policy and Practice at Interaction, the Alliance of US-Based Relief and Development Organizations. Jeremy Knendike is the Senior Policy Fellow at the Center for Global Development, where his research focuses on humanitarian response, USAID policy reform and global outbreak preparedness. He previously served four years as President Obama's Director of USAID's Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, OFTA, where he led the US government's response to international disasters, including the Ebola outbreak in West Africa and the ongoing war inside Syria. Carlos Mejia is the Executive Director of Oxfam Colombia. Carlos is an international humanitarian expert with over 25 years of experience leading programs and teams to affect strategic aid worldwide. Before joining Oxfam many years ago, he served as deputy program and operations manager for Save the Children. He spent time in numerous conflict and disaster areas, including South Sudan, Colombia, Ethiopia, China, Kosovo, and Yemen. Given all that's going on at your own workplaces, the three of you, um, as well as the, the different disasters that are currently occupying our and our time and news thread, I'd like to extend my sincerest welcome and thanks to our panel for taking their time to speak with us today. And now we're going to dive into to hearing from them. Um, so first off, we're going to hear from our panelists about what makes complex humanitarian emergencies different 
And then also think about what it is that the funder community needs to know about recovery um, or affecting change in these areas. So let's start with Jeremy and Carlos. Um, Jeremy, we'll start with you first, but, and then we'll go to Carlos. But from your experience, can you help us understand what makes complex humanitarian emergencies different from a natural disaster and what funders need to know about recovery? Yeah, there's a few things. The first thing I'd, I'd point to is the, the pace, uh, trajectory, and duration of a complex humanitarian emergency. So the, uh, it, we're at a point now in the humanitarian world where probably 80 to 90 percent of the, the, the burden on humanitarian organizations is coming from complex humanitarian emergencies. You know, as much as we think of the stereotypical humanitarian image as a search and rescue team after an earthquake or a clinic after a hurricane or something like that, that's actually these days a really small and, a, and even uh, shrinking proportion of what humanitarians are focused on. And most of the humanitarian need in the world today is coming from complex humanitarian emergencies. And you know, these are not emergencies that, that pop up uh, kill a bunch of people and then decline, and a year later, um, you know, things are back on the road to recovery again. These tend to last for a very long time, um, as we'll, we'll hear about in a minute with Yemen and Venezuela. These are long-term emergencies that are creating immense humanitarian need over a very long time period, and so that creates really different operational challenges and really different funding challenges. And one of the, um, I think, you know, for this audience, one of the things that's really different and, and interesting about protracted emergencies is that they, they the, the traditional funding model for humanitarian response, including the sort of funding that I used to provide when I was at USAID, really isn't very well adapted to them. We still tend to fund these emergencies on 12 months, 12 months, 12 month cycles, even though these emergencies often go on for five, 10, even 20 or 30 years. Um, and, and so, you know, we need to think about financing them in a different way, in a way that really reflects the the actual length and trajectory of the of these kind of emergencies. So I think that's that's one thing, and it's something this audience is probably better uh, suited to addressing than a traditional donor like USAID. Uh, the second point is, you know, with with a complex humanitarian emergency, the potential to save lives is actually much higher than it is um, in responding to a CNN style. Um, you know, flashy earthquake or hurricane sort of emergency, because in a in a natural hazard emergency, most of the people who are going to die die in the event itself, and um, there are far fewer li lives to save on the margins once that event has happened. In in a in, in a place like Yemen or a place like Venezuela, you know, the the potential to lose a lot of lives is is kind of forward looking, not not retroactive, and so the funding can ironically do more good despite these getting much less attention uh, because the, the lives are still there to be saved rather than already lost. And Carlos, what would, how, how would you respond to that question? Well, just to add some, some other points to, to what was said before, um, other elements that really make the difference between complex humanitarian emergencies and natural disaster emergencies is uh, the breakdown of the social, political, and economic fa fabric. Uh, in my experience, in complex emergencies, uh, in addition of uh, an impact of a natural phenomenon, uh, when you have a, a breakdown of the political relationships, when there is a polarization of the society, and the economy starts struggling, uh, you start facing a territory in which insecurity increase, access is becoming very difficult, trust is not anymore there, um, there is difficulty to express out openly what you think about the situation, etc. So there is fear uh, in, in the environment. Uh, and, and, and my observation in, in places where I have been do, uh, working is that uh, in, in, in a complex emergencies, the long-term impact is, is deeper and, and it will require a lot more effort, investment, and time to, to really rebuild the, the, the social, economical, and political fabric of those countries facing these kind of realities. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the political gain is behind 
this kind of crisis and, 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 and it's a political crisis with humanitarian consequences. But it, the, 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 the need for humanitarian responses is clear, but the solutions still need to be political solutions. That is incredibly helpful both to Jeremy and also to Carlos. I appreciate your insights. Let's go ahead now and do some deep diving into two specific complex humanitarian emergencies. Um, and I think we should start with Yemen. Um, and you guys can see here the, you know, some four relevant stats up on the slide here, but I'd like to hear from Joel. Um, Joel, you started talking to me about Yemen more years ago than I'd like to count and, and really highlighting to me as well as to the Center for Disaster Philanthropy about the critical needs that exist in Yemen and, and how it was woefully unattended by you know, general public as well as private philanthropy. Um, we know that Yemen's been declared the worst humanitarian disaster in the world. Um, what's important for philanthropy and the public to know about the crisis there? Uh, thanks, Regine. Um, Yemen's what happens when you take a country that imported 90% of its food before the conflict and had an already desperately poor population and you subject it to five years of civil war, five years of blockade and bombardment of port facilities, frequent attacks on civilians and the schools and health facilities that they depend on, and then to top it all off, the brave civil servants who continue to try and work in this setting despite all these difficulties have not been paid. So it's sort of the perfect storm of, of complexity and it hasn't been, somehow Yemen's never captured the, the popular imagination, which is why I would call it a neglected crisis, not only the worst crisis, but a neglected crisis. Now, what's inspiring is despite these immense challenges, the collective aid effort of the UN system, of non-governmental organizations, of Yemeni civil society has managed to reach more than 12 million people in need in, in 2019. The sectors are the ones you would expect, food, um, food production to the extent that it's possible, health, water sanitation and hygiene, shelter, education. And what's challenging in a complex emergency, I think, is on the one hand, there is, it, it, as Jeremy said, it may not be strictly speaking life-saving, but there is a combination of emergency assistance on the one hand. I mean, just keeping people alive in a, you know, in a camp for internally displaced people and an effort to maintain basic services in the, in the sectors that I, that I mentioned. So you're kind of juggling. On the one hand, you want to respond to immediate needs and need to respond to immediate needs. But the, on the other hand, we all try to do this, maybe not with a long-term perspective, given the relentlessness of the war, but at least in terms of a midterm perspective. And I think from the standpoint of, of private philanthropy in the US faced with such an immense crisis in Yemen, I think the challenge is kind of to be strategic on the one hand, but practical on the other. And to look at gap filling, to look at sectors or um, aspects of the response that are perhaps neglected and see how it might be possible for, you know, a modest amount of dollars to, uh, to make a difference. And Joel, at a later, later on in our discussion, we want to dive into what, you know, what what could a modest amount of funding look like in terms of support for under, you know, under attended or unmet needs. So um, definitely let's be thinking about that. Jeremy, what would you, what would you add to Joel's remarks as it relates to the crisis in Yemen? Well, I think Joel's characterized the crisis really well. Um, it was uh, one of, if not the most complex, uh, politically complex crises that I dealt with during my time in, in government. And one of the things that I took away from that time was the importance of not just humanitarian aid delivery, but also of humanitarian advocacy. And that's something that tends to 
not get much support, um, not get the kind of funding that it needs to be done well, but can have a hugely influential impact in a crisis like Yemen. And I say that because, uh, as, as Joel said, uh, there's you know there's been blockades of ports, there's been a lot of political blockages and impediments of aid, and um, you know we were very cognizant when I was when I was uh, working on this at USAID that the amount of aid we were providing was negligible compared to what the markets and kind of imports uh, were were bringing into the country. And so when there was something like a, a blockade of ports that cut off commercial food shipments, there was no way that aid could on its own offset that. And so we focused a ton on keeping those ports open and doing the sort of hard work, political advocacy um, within the administration to do that. And, and, and we really depended on information uh, from humanitarian advocates on the ground and and the, their advocacy shops here in Washington to keep us up to date with the latest information so that we could make the case. Um, that kind of that kind of work, which you know, compared to shipping in tons upon tons upon tons of food, isn't that costly, but it has a really outsized impact because um, by enabling us to successfully press the the Saudis to keep the ports open, I think we did. Um, you know, we averted what would have been a dramatically worse situation. And so it's important to think about humanitarian work, not just in terms of uh, throwing, you know, kind of throwing food off the back of a truck or setting up camps uh, and delivering that kind of material aid, but also um, advocacy to avoid the sort of conditions that will produce crisis um, and a crisis outcomes in the first place. Yeah, those are really helpful insights. Um, I'm, I'm about to make a really hard pivot geographically and move the discussion from Yemen over to Venezuela. But before I officially do that, I want to make sure that all of the, the folks that are on the line know that the little Q&A box down at the bottom, if you have any questions that you'd like for Joel or Jeremy or Carlos to field, um, please populate your comments there and we'll do our very best to get to them as we, as we come to the end of the conversation. Um, and now let's go ahead and turn our discussion to Venezuela. And again, on the slide, there's about, there's the slide. Um, and then on the slide again here, you'll see four bullets that really raise to the forefront the issue that we're talking about. Um, but we have Carlos on the ground in Colombia, again, leading Oxfam Colombia. So can you, Carlos, give our audience an overview of the humanitarian and refugee crisis in Venezuela and surrounding countries? Um, sure, and, and jumping from Yemen, where I used to live, uh, to Venezuela is, is a big jump, as you said. Um, well, but Venezuela, you probably all know, is, is, is already becoming a long-term uh, crisis, uh, a political crisis. It's a country that is facing internally uh, um, a humanitarian impact that is affecting at least 7 million people and only half of them, probably less, uh, have been reached by the, the, the international community to support their basic needs. But it's a, it's a country inside uh, uh, facing high restriction to access to basic services, um, still facing a polarization that is manifested through popular protests that are uh, repressed. Uh, the bureaucracy is, is way more complicated. Uh, the, the, the needs of the response only reach less than 50% of the funding, funding needed, high insecurity. Um, in Venezuela, more than 75, I would say, the NGOs are working in about 231 municipalities out of 335 municipalities. And it's still the most affected people are women, kids, handicapped, uh, and indigenous communities. But this is Venezuela. Now the region has been impacted by this uh, internal crisis. Uh, we have uh, registration of Venezuelans going up to Mexico, down to Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, Peru, Guyanas, uh, Costa Rica, Ecuador, and, and certainly Colombia. Just in Colombia, we have been uh, registering uh, about 1.7 million of um, 
migrants coming into the country, out of them about 1 million are irregular and documented uh, migrants, and mostly of them are uh, small family groups, many of times lead by women uh, with kids and all people. The, the impact is, is deep, deeply serious in, in, in our country because we already are facing with still 8 million IDPs from the long-term conflict in Colombia. So Venezuela, the problem with Venezuela right now is we don't know how long it will take to, to, to overcome the crisis. No one knows. There are so many different efforts and so many failures behind those efforts. So we, lo we don't know if migrants are coming out uh, more and more or they are going to start returning because they are facing xenophobia and lack of opportunities in many countries. Let me give, give you an example. In the last four weeks, we know that many, many migrants who came to Colombia towards Chile and Peru have been uh, returning to Colombia. Um, and, and there are evidence of some of them returning back to Venezuela. Um, so we, we are really, really unclear of what is going to happen in this country. Diplomacy has been failing for, 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 for just quite a long time. Um, so, so the crisis is open and, and full of uncertainty. I, I I so appreciate and I'm I'm so appreciative of your questions, at Carlos, of saying what you do and what you don't know, um, and just trying to tie together some of what Jeremy and Joel said, um, and then and then tying it into what you've just said about recovery. Like, what does recovery look like both in Venezuela and in the region, and what can the funding, you know, the philanthropic community do? Right, um, you know, I, I am very close to the, the piece of the response that uh, we are offering to migrants from Colombia, but Oxfam is having a, a regional also approach and a strategy to, to respond to the crisis. Um, the, the, the recovery process uh, definitely is, is, is going to be hard, as always it is, not just in Venezuela, but anywhere in the world. It's a process that will take time, that will need investment, that will require a strong coordination among all the actors from the civil society, international community, and the government that require also a lot of clarity uh, and, and, and I would say a strong diplomacy from the international community, but also from the civil society and active citizens diplomacy that uh, help the, pro the process of rebuilding the relationships uh, in a country that is highly polarized. polarized. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, the, 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 the recovery process has to be built upon the, the efforts from the international community around the, you know, the neighbor, neighboring countries of Venezuela uh, in terms of the humanitarian response. This is the time of the nexus in my mind. We need to make sure that we help the process of responding to humanitarian needs into the recovery process in a way that um, um, stabilize the political uh, and social relationships in the country. Uh, open up the, the access to response to and the people, having a strong monitoring systems in place, having clear uh, channels for clear information what is going on, um, welcoming the international community expertise to work with uh, municipalities, with regional and national agencies in partnership with uh, the civil society organizing different forms to really, really uh, help Venezuela to, to, to move forward uh, and, and to heal as well. I will say that um, because because the, the, in this kind of crises, the, the long-term prolongation of the crises uh, uh, really impact the, 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 the life of people. And people become frustrated and exhausted and, and they lose their hope. And, 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 and that impact is also an important piece of the recovery process. 
That's really helpful insight to, to thinking about recovery, Carlos. Um, I want to draw out um, something that we have learned through our 2019 Measuring the State of Disaster Philanthropy report. We know that in 2017, right, so the year that the United States saw Hurricanes Harvey, Irma Maria, the California wildfires, um, Mexico saw back-to-back -back earthquakes, um, the Syrian refugee crisis was continuing, the situation in Yemen was, was um, all, you know, a, a huge humanitarian crisis in 2017. And what we learned was that over, excuse me, official development assistance by 30 government members of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development through their Development Assistance Committee, so OECD DAC, totaled 21 billion with a B for disasters and humanitarian crises in 2017. And then non-DAC government donors and multilateral organizations contributed an additional 1.9 million. So, or, you know, on, on, excuse me, an approximate is that there were $23 billion donated by those two entities. In, in contrast, um, we, we looked at um, foundations, public charities, and corporations, and were able to identify um, $504 million from philanthropic entities and then $245 million from, from corporations. And we also know from this research that very few of those philanthropic and corporate dollars go to complex humanitarian emergencies, but rather go to those natural disasters that Jeremy was talking about, like that we see with the big, the big photo of um, an earthquake has just happened, a hurricane has just happened. So Jeremy, in light of the fact that, um, that you know, government funding for complex humanitarian emergencies tends to be time limited, as you identified before. What is it that you think that private philanthropy can do that government cannot, and why and how can this be useful to a complex humanitarian emergency? Thanks, Regine. Yeah, um, you know what, I think what, what governments have is scale, um, but they're also slow and pretty uh, pretty inflexible. So, uh, you know, when I was at USAID, I could throw a lot of money at problems, but um, I was pretty constrained in which problems I could throw that at and how I could throw it. Um, I didn't have a lot of uh, ability to be agile compared to what uh, aid organizations could do with philanthropic funding or with uh, private donations. And so I think that, that, you know, that ability to be flexible and agile um, even if the scale is not as big, is a, a hugely important asset and one that could deliver a lot of good within uh, within complex humanitarian emergencies. Uh, you know, a couple ideas on what that would look like. One is uh, putting forward some humanitarian funding that actually matches the pace of the the crisis itself. So, you know, for most humanitarian traditional uh, government donors we would have to, uh, or we were in the habit of at least, giving money in, in 12 month chunks, regardless of how long the crisis had been going on. And that makes it really hard for a humanitarian organization to plan uh, along the sort of timeline that they know the crisis is going to take. So if you think of Bangladesh right now, where uh, the Rohingya refugees have been displaced and they're likely to be there for a number of years, if you think of the long-term displacement of people in Somalia or in South Sudan or in Syria, you know, we, we, we know once a complex humanitarian emergency has been underway for a year or two, we can generally assume it's going to go on for another five to 10, yet most funding does not reflect that. Uh, and that's because, you know, for, if you're a government, you're getting your money appropriated by your Congress or your parliament every year and so on. Well, that, that's an area where I think philanthropy could have a lot to, uh, could have a really useful role to play in providing some resources to aid organizations that are able to take a longer term view that don't all have to be spent within 12 months of the grant being issued and renewed every year and so on, but could take a longer term approach. The, 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 the second is flexibility. So typically with, a, with most humanitarian funding, you need to be able to say right at the beginning of your grant what you think you're gonna do with the funding. And then if situations change, it can be quite bureaucratic to go back and make those changes. Um, yet we know that what really delivers results, especially over longer time periods, is not um, 
a, a, a rigorous log frame in advance where you've anticipated every contingency, because of course that's impossible, but rather taking an adaptive management approach where uh, you, you work closely with the community and you adapt to conditions on the ground so that um, you can make uh, reasonable judgments um, and a sort of iterative approach to these very complex problems, which is, is over time is much more effective, but that's very, very difficult for governments to fund. And then a third thing um, that I think private philanthropy can do more easily than, than a government donor is to fund um, independent accountability. So there is a growing movement, and, and I've written about this, but there's a growing movement towards um, really bringing through the voices of affected people much more clearly and giving them more influence and, and, and power within the process and power to hold or aid organizations more accountable. Now that sh you would think that's a no brainer, but it actually doesn't happen that often. And it, it, it is not uh, robustly or, or anywhere near sufficiently funded through traditional funding channels. I think that's an area where you know, putting some money into feedback mechanisms and uh, kind of more comprehensive, more comprehensive data gathering on um, uh, on the, the voices of affected people and what they're asking for, as opposed to just uh, mediating that all through big aid organizations, I think would be a huge value. Jeremy, thank you for that. I, I will admit I'll take adaptive programming and feedback mechanisms over a, a complicated log frame pretty much any day of the week. So I appreciate you highlighting that. Um, and I know I just said that in a wry tone of voice, but but I, I really mean it. Um, log frames can be tricky and adaptive programs can be so impactful. Um, Joel, you mentioned in our planning for this webinar that funders really need to be realistic and think about whether it's actually practical to do quote unquote recovery work in a complex humanitarian emergency. Can you expand on that and, and walk us through your thinking? Yeah, so what I had in the back of my mind there is, and, and Regine, maybe this is a bit of a, just a definition, definitional thing that maybe is not so, uh, not so meaningful. But what I, what I meant was basically, look, if, if, if bombs are falling and communities are running for their lives, yes, we're there, we want to be present, we are going to be present, and we're always thinking about long-term needs. But is that really the moment where you want to make an investment in, in recovery? I mean, I, I don't know, you know, there, there, might, be, there might be disagreement, but I, I, I think there are moments that are appropriate for recovery and moments when you really need to, to you know, basically double down on, on protecting people, whether it's through programming or through advocacy, you know, uh, delivering basic needs. If you get into things like education, you're gonna be, I think, taking more of a short to medium view rather than a, rather than a long-term view. So my, my point there was simply, you know, don't don't overthink it. In other words, if the if if there's if um, whether it's a foundation or an individual donor, if your fundamental um, desire or priority is to focus on on recovery, I think to some extent that is going to dictate where where in the world you you choose to work. I mean, you're going to want to choose maybe in the complex emergency realm, a situation that, that's more protracted, that maybe is a little bit more stable from a, from a security standpoint. But, and then, I mean, recovery, what does recovery look like in Yemen right now? I mean, to me, it's basically about thinking about when there is peace, when there's a me measure of stability, what will, will the urgent things uh, what what urgent things will will need need to be done to get uh, uh, the Yemeni people and Yemeni society back on a track where they can where they can you know plan and have a measure of, of stability that will allow them to even think about recovery. So recovery is an incredibly 
um, important and, and valued perspective to take into, I think, any emergency context where it's disaster response or a complex emergency. But I, my, my advice is basically pick your spots. Um, and in some contexts, you know, uh, more of an emergency response may actually be more valuable and impactful than a recovery response, depending on the overall context. That makes a ton of sense, Joel, and I appreciate the, the pragmatic advice you just said. You know, a lot of times as funders, we, we honestly just want to know what our right and appropriate insertion point is, and so your counsel of don't overthink um, and, you know, and, and sort of find your lane to me makes a tremendous amount of sense. I've got one more question for the three of you, and then we're going to turn to our Q&A from the audience. Um, and I'm directing this question to all of you, but, but Carlos, maybe you'll want to take the first stab. Um, and it's about the political situation, right? So how can funders avoid the concerns about the politics of a situation and still support humanitarian response? Uh, that is, an, is a very difficult question. Uh, this is my, my personal opinion about that, uh, uh, Regine. Um, I, I would say it's better not to avoid it. It's, it's, it's good to, to understand the political complexities uh, behind those complex humanitarian emergencies. Because if, if, if funders understand the complexity of what is going on, they can really identify what is the best way to invest to local organizations that are grounded in those very difficult contexts in a way that they respond to the humanitarian needs and avoid the politicization of AIDS, which is a very, very difficult piece to, to discern in this kind of context. Um, so the, to me, the key is to really uh, one, understand the complexity of what is going on. Two, to keep understanding and learning the, 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 the humanitarian landscape and the meaning of the principles that should guide the actions of humanitarian actors in the ground. And, 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 and the third one is, besides flexibility, which was said before, and I agree with that, is to, to really spend time to, to build trust and proximity with those organizations that are grounded in the context of those humanitarian, complex humanitarian emergencies of crises. Um, I, I will say that is, is, that is, in my mind, the reality is so complex and sometimes chaotic that for funders, finding the place of supporting what others are doing in the ground is, is the key element and building that relationship is building a relationship based on trust and mutual knowledge and, 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 and ongoing proximity, communication, exchange, and, and conversation, discussions about what to do, how to do it, uh, in order to really reach out to, to the most affected population of those crises from the principles of the humanitarian uh, 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 work. Um, the, 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 the big challenge is, is to invest, to guarantee that this, those investments protect and, and assist the rights and the lives of those most vulnerable affected population. Joel, how would you respond to the concern about the politics of the situation? My my view is is it's it's vital for any fun anyone who's I mean by definition we're we're intervening we're we're getting involved we're we're going to places that maybe we've never lived before that we don't collectively have much understanding of there are political dynamics that we need to be um, to be aware of that's absolutely vital so you know I, I just I no one neither the the philanthropist nor the humanitarian should be naive or unknowledgeable i mean we should be there with with knowledge and a full understanding of the political complexities however the way to 
steer clear or the way to program with integrity, I think, is basically to apply that knowledge and to work in, in partnership with organizations that have a proven ability to, to navigate in, in these complex political environments. And those might be you know, large international organizations, you know, like a Norwegian Refugee Council that you know, tries to adhere to the humanitarian principles, or it might be you know, even conceivably, uh, you know, a national NGO or a civil society organization, um, maybe a faith-based organization that, again, has a proven, uh, the key, what, what we're all looking for is um, organizations and individuals that have, that have demonstrated an, an ability to assist vulnerable people without falling into all the political traps or you know stepping on the political landmines and that's why i think look whether it's a disaster or a complex emergency you know local knowledge local understanding knowledge of the context is absolutely vital i guess my argument would be that's true even more so in in a Yemen or a or a Venezuela, so it's it it's demanding. I mean, in a, it demands a level of of expertise and and analysis that um, I I hope. I in other words, I don't want this to be by emphasizing this. I hope this isn't discouraging the funders. But you know, the idea is um, let's be sure we know what what we're doing. Let's be sure we're linking up with partners who know what they're doing, and in that way, the the political risk can be minimized. That's a super helpful answer, Joel. And Jeremy, I'm gonna ask you to tag onto what Joel just said, and at the same time, answer a question brought to us by Hannah Hillison um, that I, that I think flows quite naturally from what what Joel said about not wanting to discourage philanthropic investment. And her question is this, the complexity of complex humanitarian emergencies can often be overwhelming to donors who often answer to their communities or audiences regarding impact of the programs they fund. How can we more clearly articulate impact and speak about these types of complex conflicts in a way that better show the long-term impact of this work, especially with institutions that traditionally fund emergency response? Yeah. Um so just to, to quickly pick up on what Joel said and then to, to answer that, um, you, know, I, these, you know, obviously these are invariably political, uh, you know, they have, have political dimensions to these crises because you're, you're talking often about conflict, you're talking about displacement. Um, I think there's an opportunity there for, for funders as well. Um, one of the things that I, I think needs to be better supported in the humanitarian sector, and it doesn't always get a lot of support, is uh, strong uh, socio-political analysis to to support humanitarian response and decision making. And there are organizations that that have started doing this, and, and um, a place I used to work, Mercy Corps, has has begun doing this in a number of settings and doing it quite well. But they're basically doing it on their own dime. Um, they're not getting support to do it. But they they and other organizations that have taken that approach have have found that, you know, if you if you bring in the right capabilities and their capabilities that um, don't otherwise normally exist in humanitarian projects, uh, you know, people with more sort of an anthropological background and a and a political analysis background, uh, you can you can really enhance your ability to have impact because having that better more granular political awareness enables better access and safer access and, and enables you enables an organization to stay in place uh, where it might otherwise find it too difficult to navigate the the complex conflict or, or political dynamics. Um, so I think that's an area that that is ripe for more support in humanitarian action. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the, the the question that you mentioned, um, I, yeah, you know, in in, a, in in one way, articulating impact in a humanitarian setting is really really easy because if you've got a place like Yemen or a place like Venezuela where there are um, millions of starving people or millions of displaced people and you know, you can reach a proportion of them and address their needs. That's a pretty straightforward. Um, that's a pretty straightforward impact equation. Um, 
I think what is what is tougher, and if I understood the question right, is you know, articulating why it's better to do that in a longer term way, and how how you how you articulate that when you're looking at some of these longer term needs. And I think um, you know that underscores. I think that's doable, but I think it underscores also the need to support research and data um, on impact. And look, if you can, um, if an if an if an organization can move away from uh, a very capital-intensive intervention towards a capacity-intensive intervention. What I mean by that is move away from something where the aid organization is putting a lot of time and effort into delivering stuff and towards an intervention that enables the population to meet those needs more effectively on their own. Well, that in the long run is a fantastic, a fantastic value add because you're, you're both reducing burden on humanitarian delivery and you're increasing and enhancing people's dignity and ability to support themselves. Um, but it's not the sort of thing that shows up as easily in a log frame. And so I think um, working with kind of working with researchers and doing really strong evaluation alongside the programs that you're funding can help to, uh, can help to better capture the impact. But that can also be catalytic because uh, when I was at USAID, it was always really useful to me to see some of the innovative work, the innovative practice that aid organizations were doing, and if they had, if they captured that well through research, then that could really in influence our funding decisions at USAID because we could see, okay, you know, we don't have to be the one to take the risk on this, but now that this has been piloted and there's good data showing it's been effective, well, now we can we can adopt that and take it to scale. And I think that's been the story with a whole range of different interventions in humanitarian response, but particularly around cash programming which now has really taken the humanitarian world by storm. But if I go back to my own field work um, 10, 15 years ago, no one did that because everyone assumed that it, would, it wouldn't work. And, um, and so it was really those pilot efforts to try it, study it, build the evidence base that over time then has had a huge influence on the sector at large. Thank you for that so much. That was, you packed a lot of good information in there, Jeremy. Um, Carlos, question for you from Andrea Osorio, which is to what extent do government sanctions play a role in, in preventing access to humanitarian aid in crisis situations? And she's asking, you know, she put Venezuela and Cameroon as example countries to, to discuss. Well, always, uh, if there, is, there are governments in place, um, uh, imposing sanctions and, and closing the, the space and the access to international organizations to the UN uh, community or to uh, you know, any kind of organization that is, is lead by humanitarian principles to respond to a humanitarian crisis, uh, there is a problem. You know? We have a problem. Is you know how do we depolitize the the, the humanitarian the the politic, the yeah the humanitarian response? In other words, is how do we help the, the 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 governments that are part of the problem to understand that there are a minimum principles that we agree to respect in order to to protect and assist the most vulnerable people affected by those crises. Um, so, so, yeah, that is a, a, a situation clearly present in, in Venezuela, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, yeah I, I don't know what else to say, but yes, when, when the governments are not willing to protect their own citizens from the humanitarian principles, because there is a humanitarian crisis as a result of the political crisis, uh, it, it, it becomes really, really difficult to, to get to those people. And, and let me tell you, that's one of the reasons many, many Venezuelans are pulling out from their country into Colombia and the other neighboring countries. Yeah, that makes sense. Joel, um, as a representative of an NGO with field presence, how do you express the need for humanitarian advocacy to philanthropy, which is, as Katie Murray identifies in her question, kind of more abstract than the direct provision of humanitarian assistance. Well, that, that regime, as you may know, is like the most beautiful hanging curveball of a question <laughs> to me. I, <laughs> Sorry. I mean, Sorry, I'm no, just really, reading off the page. It's beautiful, no, because I've, I, I mean, I, I've 
basically my whole career, I've tried to combine, you know, operational response and, um, and, and advocacy. And I, I think, um, you know, Jeremy alluded to this earlier. I mean, Carlos, you know, works for an organization, Oxfam, that I started my career with that is 100% um, committed to advocacy. And the way I would express it is there are, as we've been discussing, there are political obstacles to crisis response. And our responsibility at some fundamental level is to be a witness. Um, you know, Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders has used witnessing terminology as have the Quakers, American Friends Service Committee. I mean, there's a long tradition in our sector of not just handing things out to vulnerable people, but trying to understand why they're vulnerable and then translating that into advocacy that will change the things that are making their lives miserable, that will try and get at some of the causes of the, of the vulnerability that they're experiencing. And that can be, in the case of Yemen, pointing out um, violations of international humanitarian law by parties to the conflict. In the case of, of Venezuela, it can be talking about the impact of sanctions, but also the impact of, of government policies in terms of impoverishing their own people. That, in other words, we get, we get again, it's, it's trying to get beyond the kind of naive humanitarian view that we're there just to, that, that helping people by handing them things is, is good enough. By, by intervening, by getting involved, I felt my whole career, there's just such a huge responsibility that we have. We talk now about, you know, projecting the voices of affected people, of allowing, say, Yemenis to speak for themselves. That's incredibly difficult in this media environment, in this crazy environment that we're in, where even getting the Yemen crisis writ large to break through is almost impossible. In that context, it's our responsibility to talk about what people are experiencing, why they're experiencing the problems that they're facing, and what some of the so solutions might be including diplomatic solutions and, and political solutions. I mean, the counter argument is always, well, you're getting political and, you know, who are you, X organization, to give a political analysis of X, Y, or Z situation? And, I mean, there's some truth to that. But as long as it's grounded in our actual experience side by side with people, I think it's valid. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm looking at the time and, I, and I'm going to start to wrap us up. So apologies to the six of you who have, who have unanswered questions, but please know that our contact information or my contact information is going to be available on the, the uh, another slide forthcoming. So you're more than welcome to email me and I'm happy to triage questions out to Joel, Jeremy or Carlos. Um, I want to summarize some of the discussion and provide all of you with some key takeaways from our conversation. Um, complex humanitarian emergencies really are a, a time for us to think about providing multi-year grants. It's perhaps not the time for us to be thinking about complex programming, as, as Jeremy had talked about with the, you know, heavy log frame. Um, Joel actually nudged me with another idea for, for how to make a real applicable approach to philanthropic support of complex humanitarian emergencies, which is to fund neglected sectors. Um, and he suggested three. So, for instance, protection, gender-based violence, and legal support as a way to, again, find that insertion point and also demonstrate impact to the various audiences that, that you all as funders look to. Um, third, the nature of a crisis could mean that aid looks really different than it does during a natural disaster. Uh, recovery from complex humanitarian emergencies looks distinctly different including the timelines, implementation, vision, and commitment. Our panelists really in, encourage you all to be planful about your giving and not to just react to the latest news media report. Um, and as Joel, um, actually all three, Joel, Carlos, and Jeremy spoke about, political advocacy can be as important as aid itself. 
Um, and again, you've also heard from the from comments across our panelists that getting feedback from actual clients on the ground, building that in um, to our to the funding stream, and asking clients how they benefited from the funding, and then making changes based upon that client input is incredibly, incredibly powerful. As all of our panelists have shared, there's going to be ongoing needs to assist with recovery efforts for years to come. CDP has many, many resources, including our Global Recovery Fund, that are devoted to disaster philanthropy that can assist you um, and our staff, myself um, and the, the other 15 of us, are always available to provide guidance. You can find more information about our work at www.disasterphilanthropy.org. And for those of you who might be planning disaster response funding, we have additional resources also on our website, but we have one that's called our Disaster Philanthropy Playbook, and that can be found at disasterplaybook.org. And in order to respect everybody's time, our panelists and all of you who are listening, and to keep this to an hour, Unfortunately, this is really all the time that we have for today's webinar. I'd, like, I'd love to extend my sincerest thanks and hearty, just hearty um, uh, appreciation for Jeremy, Carlos, and Joel for taking the time out of their day to share their insights. I'd also like to offer a special thanks to the UPS Foundation for hosting this webinar and to our co-sponsors, the Council on Foundation, the Funders Network for Smart Growth and Livable Communities, Emerging Practitioners in Philanthropy, New England International Donors, and Interaction. And for all of those of you who have joined this conversation, I'd like to thank you as well. If you have any questions or any thoughts that weren't addressed during today's webinar, you're more than welcome to email me at regine.webster at disasterphilanthropy.org. Thank you all so much and have a great afternoon.